So Matt, obviously one of the other things that came out of that review article in the animal stuff was, as you said, the protein restriction. And I think of all the topics in nutrition, this is the one I'm most interested in. Uh, I really don't care that much about fat and carbs, don't tell anybody, <laughs> but I care an awful lot about protein. Um, you know, in fact, when you came over today, you probably saw me chasing down what was left of a protein shake. And I think <laughs> right. I was mentioning to you or my wife, like, that's the only part of nutrition that is kind of, um, I don't want to say a chore, but it, it's a very deliberate part of how I go about the day, which is I really have to think about it. And the reason is I'm trying to eat a gram of protein per pound of body weight spread out into four buckets. Right. Right. Because if you, you know, I think there's re reasonable evidence to suggest that if you consume too much protein in one sitting, uh, and it's typically more than about 0.25 grams per pound is the general thinking, you're going to end up oxidizing some of that protein. So it's not that it's harmful. It's just that you're not getting the amino acids you need for muscle protein synthesis, which is, of course, our objective. So that means I'm kind of walking around trying to get 40 grams here, 40 grams there, 40 grams here, 40 grams there. And truthfully, that's um, not trivial if you're not willing to consume a whole bunch of crap with it. I mean, if you're really just trying to focus on the protein quality. So look, the RDA says I'm crazy, right? The recommended daily allowance of protein is 0 0.8 grams per kilogram, right? Which is less than half of what I would consume. Why, why, where do you see the and by the way, it's not just that I'm making up the amount that I'm consuming. I, I'm doing it on the basis of other data that suggests that this is the amount of protein consumption you need for optimal muscle protein right. synthesis. Right. So where does this disconnect? Yeah. So, I mean, I think, first of all, um, <clears throat> we can talk about the rodent studies, right, which is in the, the biology of aging. I think the RDA question, you know, they're, they're, that, that's a different question. It's my understanding that that actually was developed to be a protein balance for 95% of the population when sedentary, right? So I think <clears throat> what that means, first of all, that's a minimum amount, not yeah. necessarily the optimal amount. And it probably very much depends on lifestyle, right? Um, and lean body mass to begin with, absolutely. even though it's sort of normalized yeah. too. So it, I think, but, I think I, and the reason why I, I bring this up is I think there's a lot, again, a lot of confusion among the general public about what the RDA means. And it's not... <laughs> It's not necessarily a bad thing to be above the RDA in some areas, right? Yep. Maybe a lot of areas. So I think that's just worth worth you know uh, expanding on just just a little. Yeah, bit. Yeah, I think I, I agree completely. I, I I sort of jokingly think of the RDA for protein as what you need to not waste away and wither up and die. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So right. So you're not losing muscle mass. Yeah. yeah. So so then the the question of what is the relationship between protein and aging, I think, is a really important yep. one, and it's gotten a lot of attention in the field. Um, uh, and like I think a lot of other things, there's a lack of clarity about what we actually know and what we should be recommending to people. So let's take a step back and start with the animal studies, the, the mouse studies. Um, I think there it's pretty clear that you can extend lifespan through protein restriction. And there are actually, again, a couple of flavors of protein restriction. You can restrict all protein down to you know some some percentage, some low percentage, um, or you can restrict specific amino acids, particularly branch um, chains, tryp tryptophan, oh. methionine, or branch chain amino acids are the ones that have been studied. And and again, I make that distinction because it's not really clear that the mechanisms are the same across these different flavors of, of protein res restriction. The common mechanism that that does seem to uh, potentially underlie all of these forms of protein restriction is inhibition of mTOR. And again, that's partly why this um, becomes complicated, when we, especially when we start talking about extrapolation to human. You and I both recognize that inhibition of mTOR can have beneficial effects in the context of aging and health span, certainly in mice, almost certainly in people, I would say. Um, and protein is an activator of mTOR. And we know a fair amount about the biochemistry of that, that, that particularly branch chain amino acids can directly activate mTOR through cestrins, and that's sort of all worked out. Um, and so it seems counter, it seems mm -hmm. intuitive that protein restriction would be beneficial by turning down mTOR. It seems counterintuitive that, that what you were just talking about would be beneficial because you might be hyperactivating mTOR. So we can dive into that. Yep. But I think that that's kind of the, that's the, that's the simplest possible mechanism I can think of for why 
protein restriction, especially branch chain amino acid restriction would be having an impact on lifespan and health span in mice. Um, the other player that seems to be important, particularly in um, total protein restriction, is uh, a protein called FGF21, fibroblast growth factor 21, that is uh, secreted in response to a low protein diet and then has effects on liver metabolism and, and also inhibition of mTOR reduction of IGF-1. So that seems to be required for the lifespan extension that is seen from protein restriction in mice potentially partially upstream of, of mTOR and, and liver metabolism. The interesting thing there is FGF21 overexpression by itself has also been reported to be sufficient to extend lifespan in mice. So, um, so it kind of fits that that, that could be part of the, the story. Mm -hmm. um, so the question then, one question is, is protein restriction always beneficial in mice and can we separate it from caloric? restriction. And so th this is where you really have to look closely at the studies and determine, you know, did the mice on protein restriction eat less, eat the same amount and eat more? And it's interesting because you can actually find examples of all of those. And honestly, I don't really understand why that's the case, except it's something about the different compositions of the diet. Um, uh, what does seem to be the case is that when you restrict for certain amino acids, you're, if you're deficient for a, a, a methionine, for example, or tryptophan, the mice absolutely will eat more and they don't gain weight and they do seem to live a little bit longer. So that could be a somewhat distinct mechanism there hmm. um, that we don't really understand. So, so tell me, what was the most compelling evidence you saw when you tried to tease apart the relationship between protein and total intake? Um, so again, I think the branched chain amino acid and, and methionine restriction studies are, are pretty clear that those animals are consuming more calories, more calories than that. Certainly if you match the weight than mm -hmm. the ad libitum mice and they're living longer. And what do we think is the uh, route or mechanism through which methionine exerts this effect? I don't know that, that that's still really being, being worked out. There are lots of mechanisms that have been proposed. I suspect mTOR plays a role. Um, you know, people have thought about, so of course, uh, you know, methylation, methyl donors are important for a bunch of different epigenetic modifications. So there may be a role there going back to the epigenome that mm -hmm. we talked about. Methionine is the first amino acid in every protein. Yep. So there could be effects on protein synthesis. There's evidence linking methionine restriction to sulfur amino acid, uh, biology, which has been implicated in, in aging. So it, it's hard to know, and maybe it's not one thing. It's hard. And it's those hard all to know. sound like potentially just a substrate reduction problem, right? Like less sulfur cross bridging, less protein synthesis. Right. Well, uh, yeah, and and again, you know, if you look back in the the literature in the invertebrates, inhibition of and inhibition of protein synthesis in some cases is enough to extend lifespan. And of course, mTOR is a primary regulator of protein synthesis. Yeah. So when you inhibit mTOR you can also inhibit protein synthesis. So there's, that's part of the challenge here is this network is so interconnected that when you tweak one part of it, you have effects throughout the network and it's really hard to know which of those effects are causal. Uh -huh.